Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you who are joining us from other time zones. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kim Brown, and we will get started in just about one more minute, okay? Okay, actually it looks like our logging in has, has slowed down already, so we will go ahead and get started. We have a lot of great information to share with you today. Again, welcome to everyone. My name is Kim Brown. I'm with the Montana Pre-ETS Technical Assistance Center, and that stands for Pre-Employment Transition Services, and I will be your moderator for today. This webinar is sponsored by the Montana Pre-Employment Transition Services Technical Assistance Center, and is funded in whole or in part under a contract with the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. The statements shared in the presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the department. All of our audience members are currently muted. This allows for a much quieter environment and cuts down on the background noise. So if you do want to ask any of the presenters a question or make a comment, please type your question or comment into the chat or question box. And in order to see that, if it's not up on your screen right now, look to the upper right-hand corner of your computer screen, and there should be an orange box with a white arrow in it. If you click on that, one of the boxes that you should see is either a chat or a question box, and that's where you can type in any questions or comments that you might have. You'll also notice that we have several handouts for today posted on there, in addition to a PDF version of today's PowerPoint, if you're interested in downloading that and keeping the slides for yourself or printing off any of them. Please note that if you type in a question or comment, only you and the presenters and myself will be able to see what you've typed in. Um, I will be reading the questions out loud for the presenters so that everybody in the audience knows what's being asked and what's being answered. We will have a couple of question and answer periods during today's session, and we'll let you know when it's time for those, but please feel free to type in your questions or comments at any time. For those of you who requested Montana Office of Public Instruction Renewal Units when you registered, we will email those to you after the webinar, and it can take up to a couple of weeks to get those sent out. Please note that you do have to have pre-registered and requested the OPI credit in order to receive that. And unfortunately, we are currently unable to issue any other kinds of attendance documentation. Today's session is being audio taped for the Prietz Resource Library, and the recording for the webinar will be posted to the Montana Vocational Rehabilitation and Blind Services YouTube channel as soon as possible. It can take two to three weeks to get those recordings posted. And we have a slide a little bit later in today's presentation that will give you the URL or website address for that YouTube channel. I'll also post it in the chat box shortly. Um, and as I mentioned, the slides and other resources for today's session are available for download in the handouts area on your screen. When you log out of today's webinar, a survey link will pop up. Please do take the time to answer those survey questions. There are only about eight questions, and we do read through all of the responses that we receive. We use what you tell us in order to choose topics for future webinars and also to try to continually improve the information that we're sharing and the ways in which we're sharing it. So again, please do take the time to complete that survey. Also, please note that some of the information shared today will be Montana specific. So if you are tuning in from another state, please check with your local vocational rehabilitation agency and others who, in, who are involved with CREATS in your community to learn the specific policies and resources available for your area. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today and tell you a little bit about each one, and then we'll go ahead and move into the presentation. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us Isaac Baldry. Isaac graduated from Custer County District High School in 2010. He's self-employed in his own company, Isaac Baldry Consulting. He works nationally as a public speaker, focusing on youth issues and assistive technology. His use of technology was featured in the 2012 spring edition of Apostrophe magazine. He has since continued to write periodic articles for the magazine. Within the state of Montana, Isaac does contract work in the area of youth disability issues. Isaac attended the Montana Youth Leadership Forum in 2008 and works as the Region 1 facilitator for My Transitions. He has been a member of the Rural Institute Consumer Advisory Council since 2008 
And I always love to mention the fact that in all of those years, he has not missed a single meeting. And he has presented on multiple webinars for the Rural Institute. Additionally, for the Rural Institute, he is a private contractor for the Montana Pre-Employment Transition Services Technical Assistance Center. He enjoys his work with the state protection and advocacy organization, Disability Rights Montana, sharing his knowledge of assistive technology to improve access for those with disabilities. Isaac believes in a balanced life, carving out time for activities he enjoys. He is a sports enthusiast and will often be at the game, whatever the sport. In the summertime, he is busy with his raised garden beds and motorcycle rides. We're also very fortunate to have with us today Melissa Dadman, who has a master's in education and is a project coordinator for the Montana Pre-Employment Transition Services Technical Assistance Center. Melissa also works as a project coordinator for the University of Montana's Introduction to College program for high school students with disabilities through the College of Health and Human Services. Melissa's employment background has focused on social justice issues surrounding poverty, housing, and education. While working on her master's in education and special education endorsement, Melissa participated in the Training Teachers to Ensure Achievement and Membership, or T-Team, project, whose mission is to increase the capacity of schools and teachers to provide effective instruction to students with low incidence disabilities. Melissa has taught elementary, high school, and post-secondary students. In her current positions, she enjoys providing technical assistance for pre ets activities and supporting students in counseling for post-secondary education and work-based learning experiences. And our third speaker for today is Teresa Baldry. We're thrilled to have Teresa here. She's a proud mother of six children, including a son with a disability. Her belief that knowledge is power has directed her areas of employment in the disability field. From 2001 to 2016, she worked for Pluck, Parents Let's Unite for Kids, supporting families, and she served as a member of the leadership team. Technology has played a key role in Teresa's son's life, and as his primary support for the last 20 years, she has needed to stay in front of what he has wanted that technology to do. She began working for Montec in October 2012 to share the wealth of knowledge that she and her son have learned over the years. In 2016, she began working for the Prietz Technical Assistance Center with the Rural Institute as a project coordinator serving eastern Montana. Teresa serves on the Disability Rights of Montana Board of Directors currently as the president. She's been a member of the Rural Institute Consumer Advisory Council since 2010, also never missing a meeting, and has presented at numerous conferences and webinars as a council member. So welcome to our presenters and to all of our audience members as well. We'll go ahead and get started with part two of the Preparing Students with Disabilities for Careers and College Through an Evolution of pre Activities webinar. Part one of the webinar is archived and available on the um, Vocational Rehabilitation YouTube channel that I mentioned earlier. And for those of you who weren't in attendance at part one, just a, a quick overview the mission of the Pre-Employment Transition Services Technical Assistance Center is to support Montana vocational rehabilitation and blind services and school staff in their provision of quality pre ets services to students with disabilities. And so the TAC team um, shares innovative ideas, does training both on-site and via webinars like the one today, um, provides on-site telephone and email technical assistance, and helps forge collaborations within communities that can make pre ets services really successful for students with disabilities. And so what are pre-employment transition services? In case you're not familiar with the, the term, um, they are intended to provide awareness, exploration, preparation, and training for students with disabilities, and students are those who are ages 14 to 21, um, with the goal of competitive integrated employment. And so for all students with disabilities, we want CIE or Competitive Integrated Employment to be the goal, um, the long range focus. And so what is Competitive Integrated Employment? It's work performed on a full or part-time basis and that can include self-employment, needs to be compensated at not less than minimum wage, not less than what's paid by the employer to other employees for similar work, it needs to be at a location where the employee interacts with other people who do not have disabilities to the same extent of someone in a comparable position. And it also needs to have opportunities for advancement. So again, I understand that's a refresher for a lot of you, but we just wanted to make sure that everyone was clear on the terms we would be talking about today. 
one of the tools that the Pre-X Technical Assistance Team developed was what we fondly call the pie chart. And it breaks down the five areas of pre-employment transition services, the five categories that are to be provided to students with disabilities. And so you'll see on here job exploration and counseling, um, work-based learning experience, experiences, excuse me, um, the post-secondary education and training instruction, workplace readiness training, and instruction in self-advocacy are the five areas. And the job exploration counseling, the work-based learning experiences, and the workplace readiness training were all covered in part one of this webinar series. So today we'll be looking at post-secondary education and we will be looking at instruction in self-advocacy. And with that, I would like to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Melissa, um, who will introduce us to the pre-employment transition services in post-secondary education arenas. Melissa? Thanks, Kim. Um, I'm happy to be here today to take a look at this progression. And as we walk through it, please know that it does not happen in isolation with the other pre -ed areas that were just mentioned. So all five categories should be intertwined to provide students with a comprehensive plan. So let's get started and take a look at this one. So here we go. And this type of progression model is meant to highlight how each activity builds on the next activity with the end goal of best preparing students with disabilities for post-secondary options. And these progressions are not linear. So you do not have to complete one activity or phase before moving on to the next. But the importance is to individualize what each student needs, um, determine what long-term goals the student has, and then work through the short-term goals or steps that are needed to achieve transition goals. So research shows um, that access to post-secondary education programs can provide increased outcomes for students with disabilities. And this includes those with more significant support needs. So participation in these activities and these programs that we'll go through can provide students with the opportunity to engage with their larger community, build awareness of self, and support employment opportunities. And again, we're always looking at this by providing meaningful, individualized pre activities to prepare students for success. Um, the examples of these resources and the progression will help provide an evolution of supports by creating the awareness, supporting the exploration, and providing preparation and training. And then keeping in mind with the format um, for part one, we're going to take a close look at each phase of the progression, and then we're going to split it up look at the associated activities and resources. And so keep in mind as we go through this that activities are always driven by student outcome, that they look differently for each student depending on their career goals and their interests and learning needs. So we're going to start with phase one, which is post-secondary education awareness. Now this phase is focused on learning about options by bringing awareness to all the different programs available. And there are many programs available that provide opportunities to attend a two-year or four-year college or university. But it is going to be equally important that we inform students of the opportunities provided through two-year or less on vocational or trade schools. So for many students, a career school will be an excellent opportunity to provide the hands-on learning related to the student's career goals. And these programs typically offer a diploma or certificate or a pathway to licensure in a particular field. And then you can also note that the Department of Labor has a, a pretty big push for apprenticeship programs across the nation. And these programs provide a really nice blend of formal classroom work and hands-on experience to develop the skills needed to enter high demand careers. So awareness of all these different possibilities will support students in defining their post-secondary goals and then the steps to achieve those goals. So here are some resources available to help meet awareness learning objectives. And inviting various guest speakers to discuss post-secondary options is a really great tool to build awareness. So this may include inviting, or should include, inviting your school's VR counselor to speak about case management services, as well as how VR can support post-secondary education programs. 
Um, it can also increase awareness of various career fields and pathways, and there are different tools about th that can help support this. Um, one such tool is Montana Career Information Systems, which I'll continue to refer to as MCIS. There's also ONET online, and then um, different job services across the nation, and in particular Montana, Montana Job Services. So here we quickly see how an overlap of other PREATS categories, such as job exploration counseling, is really important to intertwine. So accessing site, sites such as MCIS will provide students with access to interest profilers where they can identify interests and match them to potential careers. Um, during these activities, students will build awareness on the occupation and then also, equally important, the educational pathway that's required to meet those career goals. With college fairs and trades rodeos, you know, schools are providing these opportunities throughout the school year. And students can really begin to use this as an opportunity to build core comp competencies, such as organization and communication skills. So organization skills can be supported by working through college prep workbooks, such as Montana Guidebook to higher education, and communication skills can be just by talking with college staff about specific student services and supports. And then transition binders are a really excellent tool for gathering information and checklists, and students can use those to help complete their steps needed as they move through forward in post-secondary goals. Um, other documents that students will want to include are immunizations and medical records, different disability testing, entrance testing, student aid information, and high school transcripts. So what are some considerations for students with a more significant impact of disability? And just as we discussed with the work-based learning continuum, we need to raise expectations that post-secondary education opportunities are available to all students. And this can be supported by introducing post-secondary education opportunities to everyone throughout their high school experience, including those with more significant support needs. And so we'll, take, we'll want to be taking looks at comprehensive transition programs that are available across the nation. And many states offer model demonstration projects. And one of them is the transition and post-secondary programs for students with intellectual disabilities, known as TIPSID. And currently, according to Think College, there are 246 programs around the country that support post-secondary education for students with intellectual disabilities. Unfortunately, we do not have a program in Montana, and so you, know, you will want to be able to speak about these opportunities that are, are happening in other states, especially in the Northwest region. Um, research shows that the more post-secondary education one has, the greater the outcome in employment the greater the outcome in social engagement and in overall community living. So this is a really important piece for this group of students. Um, dual enrollment is another great option for students with ID. And this can mean students taking advantage of courses being offered during high school or participating in on-site post-secondary program learning. Um, it can include preparation courses consisting of college academics as well as career or technical education courses. And then we'll want to be looking at resources to provide access to financial aid for comprehensive transition programming. And that's available through the Higher Education Opportunity Act. So in 2008, HEOA authorized federal financial aid for students with intellectual disabilities to be enrolled in accredited comprehensive transition programming. Um, HEOA requires that students with ID be included with students without disabilities um, in both academic and employment settings. And then finally, we're bringing up the, the process of discovery again here in this progression. So using the process of discovery to expand meaningful activities for reaching post-secondary education goals. So as previously mentioned with discovery, it can really help the IEP team learn about who the student is, what they do, and how they do it. And during initial discovery, the information gathered can help create post-secondary education goals and then steps to meeting those goals. So by expanding what is learned through initial discovery, really meaningful activities can start to be implemented. OK, this next phase takes awareness of post-secondary education to the next level. So this phase really helps build students' motivation for post-secondary programming 
and helps them narrow down specific programs for students to further explore. So students begin to ask really important questions, which may include, you know, what type of certificate, what kind of diploma, or what kind of degree or non-degrees are needed in the career field, where do I want to live, how large of a school, and then overall, what supports are available. In this case, can support student-led planning by having students taking the lead in selecting the programs, analyzing all the information gathered, and then identifying new interests or moving on to next steps. So I'll mention MCIS again here, and, and these programs are available by the Department of Labor and other states, but it is really an excellent tool to use during this phase as it can provide program summaries. You can compare three programs side by side, and then you can show student services available for students with disability. And MCIS also offers the opportunity to actually develop post-secondary goals and assessments, and then you can develop a four-year course plan, track grades, and save multiple pathways as students continue to explore all the different interests and options. So what are the resources available in this phase? It's really going to be important to offer exploration and preparation courses to students in their junior year, if not earlier. So here students learn about academic and career interests, the dual enrollment opportunities, and they can closely examine the various types of programming to meet needs. And so, for example, at the University of Montana, Western, and Dillon, it's the only public college in the country to offer block scheduling. And this could really match a student's learning style and, and help meet those support needs a student may have. Um, once the student's list is narrowed down, completing a virtual or on-site program tour can help students get a feel for the program setting, the location, and student services. And they can also have the opportunity to really look close at student handbooks take a look into accommodations in the surrounding community, such as access to public transportation. And students can be exploring accessibility in terms of access of information, access to services, as well as access to the physical spaces to the greatest extent possible. So those tours are really helpful to see the full picture. And then this is also a really great time to visit other programs, such as Job Corps, and other adult learning programs, so students can really fully explore the full variety of options. Um, while looking at the narrow list of programs, other activities can include learning about program requirements. So what are the costs? What are the application deadlines? What about program timelines? Financial aid? And then what are the disability-related supports? And some of the things you can do is like, find individuals to interview or better yet, provide a mentorship opportunity, which can create really meaningful opportunities for exploration. So you can invite previous students with disabilities to become a mentor, or invite trades workers in for an interview or a panel discussion. And students can ask these individuals questions about what's it like in the day of the life of. You know, learn more about the application process, or listen to really different transition experiences. They can also ask these people, like, what were meaningful activities during high school? What worked and what didn't work? So the learning objectives during exploration support students in practicing decision-making skills, goal setting, and planning, and then building really needed core competencies, you know, competencies that are necessary for that post-secondary success. So again, we're going to look at what does this look like for students with more significant impact of disability. And all students, including those with intellectual disabilities, really benefit from exploration and preparation courses. So exploration courses will allow students to discover academic and career interests, while the post-secondary prep courses will be helping students develop strong skills and learn about preferred learning strategies. And then through the process of discovery, we can work with students to determine what type of post-secondary program is going to be the best fit. And as with other students, the team should really look at the program of study, the environment and setting, um, campus culture, and disability service supports. And when looking at program requirements, we've got to take a close look at policies and procedures for course substitutions, as well as degree or certificate requirements. And one important question that you may need to ask is, can a student participate in certain programs in an individualized way? 
that will help build specific skills needed for competitive employment. Another good question is, are accreditation standards implemented? Because this could really potentially impact financial aid. Again, we're looking at having site tours, so have students tour the physical spaces to the greatest extent possible. And questions you may consider during this area are, what does accessibility look like for the student? What is their access to information? How will they access services? And to help answer these, it's definitely encouraged to meet with disability services staff, the dean of students, and other program staff to learn about career development supports, disability services, student services, health services, and to think about what other ways you can support employment through programs such as job clubs, job shadows, internships, and other service learning opportunities. Again, here you can meet with current students with disabilities to help provide that firsthand narrative about different programs, the surrounding community, and the overall school culture. So the third phase is post-secondary education preparation. And here it's really meant to prepare students for post-secondary success through individualized learning opportunities and hands-on experience. So these meaningful activities support students in developing you know, the knowledge and skills necessary to reach those post-secondary goals. So information gathered throughout the work-based learning experiences can really help students prepare for specific programs of study. So these activities should match students' interests and long-term goals as much as possible. And then there's also various college in a day programs available. And in Montana, we have a great program called Moving On. And it offers high school students with disabilities a really robust three-night experience in both Missoula and Billings. So there's links to these programs on our resource slide. Um, resources such as these programs can really help prepare students to learn how to connect with college staff, professors, health services, and mentorship or tutoring groups. And they can create opportunities for instruction and self-advocacy which is a really necessary school to have throughout the post-secondary education. I'm looking at preparing for admission, taking the PSAT or the plan junior year or earlier can help students identify focus areas for further skill development. And some intentional supports will help prepare students for success. And there's a variety of application management systems available. Um, as noted earlier, NCIS, NCIS provides a platform to serve program searches, college essays, and universal college applications, as well as sets and reviews post-secondary education goals and tracks those program pathways. It's a great central place to put everything. Um, preparing students and families on how to research different forms of financial aid can open doors for post-secondary programs for many students. So students and families can learn how to access grants, loans, work study, and scholarship opportunities. And it's important to note that this information often changes, so making sure that families can learn how to review the most recent information available. And then as previously mentioned, preparing students for post-secondary success can happen during high school with access to dual enrollment programs and post-secondary preparation courses. So remember, in many post-secondary education programs, Courses, course expectations are laid out in syllabus, syllabi, and in many cases an online platform. So students will need to be taught how to digest all of that information. And then the importance of paying attention to course attendance policies, requesting accommodations, testing, due dates, you know, et cetera. Um, these courses can also prepare students to learn the ins and out of college applications and the needed requirements. And students can start adding material to their transition binder during these courses so they can prepare to continue steps after exiting high school. For example, like when a student applies for disability services, they will need to provide documentation to prove eligible. So even if a student had an IEP or a 504 plan while in high school, they may need to get a new or different test. And so making sure that if they're a VR client, you know, working through that communication, because VR has the ability to help pay for some of those tests. And then the outcome for this phase is for students to take a lead role in post-secondary education planning and preparation. So once students are in these different types of programs, they're going to be expected to manage both academic responsibilities as well as all their personal needs. So these skills will serve them in the future when they're expected to plan, set, and evaluate independently.
So how does this look for students with a more significant impact of disability? And studies continue to show that individuals with disabilities are underemployed and unemployed. So adults with developmental disabilities experience lower wages and increased likelihood of poverty and welfare and government entitlement. So post-secondary supports can really help students improve these outcomes. During this phase, it's going to be critical to build a foundation of knowledge and skills by really clarifying the student's ideal conditions for success necessary to succeed in post-secondary education, as well as determine any needs for accommodations. And so the summary of performance required by IDEA is a useful way to provide students with disabilities with information to take with them as they exit from high school. And here it will gather any academic achievement, functional performance, and recommendations for post-secondary supports. And those recommendations are going to be really helpful. So as you prepare students and tasks associated with program admission, they need to be prepared to take a standardized admission exam. So as mentioned earlier, taking the PSAT or the plan sooner than junior year can help determine skills needed. And then we need to support students to plan ahead for requesting accommodations for these tests and help determine the best test taking strategies. And remember to use these activities to build skills and self-determination all the way through. Uh, for the morgue, families can really begin to be prepared to look for additional funding in addition to FAFSA. So this will include accessing VR support and the Social Security Administration for additional funding options. Um, another resource worth mentioning here for students with significant disabilities is participating in youth leadership programs. And so in Montana, we have a Montana Youth Leadership Forum. And a lot of research support these activities. And the National Collaborative on Workforce and Disability, they did an extensive review of research programming and demonstration projects. And what they found is that youth development and leadership opportunities are critical steps to preparing all young people for successful transition into adulthood. So getting our students with significant disabilities is going to be really important to participate in programs such as these. And then finally, through the process of discovery, create person-centered opportunities for real, meaningful, work-based learning experiences all throughout high school. So setting career goals based on interests and preferences that will help guide those students along their education path. And so it's going to be critical to give exposure to a variety of career opportunities through job shadows, volunteer opportunities, and other work-based learning experiences. So training is the final phase for the post-secondary education progression. And during this phase, students must be given the opportunity to receive instructional supports and practice those skills necessary for post-secondary education success. So explicit instruction in rights and roles and responsibilities is going to be important as students enter the world of post-secondary education. Um, students need to be taught that whereas in high school they were served under IDEA, upon exiting high school, civil rights is ensured under ADA, um, Section 504, and if residing in student housing or dormitories, the Fair Housing Act. So post-secondary education programs, they, are, they may not discriminate on the basis of disability, and they must ensure that programs being offered are accessible to students with disabilities. So in higher education, students have the right to an equal opportunity. They have the right to be treated fairly and to discuss academic needs and supports, and then also to receive reasonable accommodations for success. Um, a student can choose to disclose info to disability services, and students can choose to have them disclose on their behalf. But there may be some programs where students need to disclose information to professors if accommodations are needed in that particular class. So giving explicit instruction on that process is going to be very important. Um, a great resource to learn more about this is the 411 on Disability Disclosure Workbook. Uh, students will need appropriate documentation to receive disability services and receive training in self-disclosure, as mentioned. So acquiring accommodation letters, learning how to initiate requests for accommodations, and then practicing the art of following up with requests. That's a huge piece. We're going to be looking into courses that offer financial literacy and budgeting, because this can really help students learn how to manage a budget, which includes new things for them, such as housing, transportation, 
food, entertainment, and then of course course materials. And instruction in expanded core curriculum. It should include soft skills curriculum, instruction in self-determination, and opportunities to learn more about independent living. Um, training in reasonable accommodations can help prepare as students learn more how to request specific support needs. So some examples of those reasonable accommodations might include using note takers or scribes, um, having access to readers or interpreters, discussing a reduced course load, uh, text on tape or e-text, it may be enlarged or braille texts, or even in Montana, which is important, snow removal priority. It's been a big one for this winter on campus. Very difficult. Um, schedules, assignments, and tests will look very different in post-education setting. So providing access and training and assistive technology is going to be critical for successful outcomes. Um, studies show that the use of technology, which enables success in higher education, increases the likelihood of improved career outcomes. And then finally, we have the ABLE and PASS plans, which can help students access programs financially. So informing families of the ABLE Act and how this tax advantage savings account can help cover costs across the lifespan, including different post-secondary programs, while not impacting the asset limit for SSI or any other public benefits. It's going to be important as families consider these options. And then giving information on the PASS plan to help students begin to put aside money towards a specific work-related goal, such as a program tuition, textbooks, or even a computer. And again, letting families know of these programs and that money put aside does not impact a student's savings. And it can open the door for opportunity. Here, equally important, it's to give families information if they are considering schools in other states. So they should know what they need to do to consider how going out of state may impact those benefits. So here we are again with considerations for students with more significant impact of disability. And with training, it should be focused on assistive technology, systematic instruction, and expanded core curriculum, and workplace skill development. So access and training in assistive technology is a central theme for post-secondary success. And attached, you'll find a wonderful day in the life example from Think College. And it shows how one high school student with ID and DD uses technology to support her in dual enrollment at a local college. So the student, who's named Star, she uses her smartphone and tablet on a daily basis to access a variety of apps that help her manage um, her schedule, her to-do list. She uses a stylus pen for note-taking, captioning and videos for class presentations. She uses iCloud storage for collaboration with peers and e-text for homework and reading. So access and training and technology supports really can allow students to independently manage their budgets, set reminders, and track due dates. So STAR, she, she's a really great example at how assistive technology can make or break the post-secondary education experience. So make sure to take a look at that. And there's other examples provided on Think College's website. So we need to be ensuring students have access and training and technology to increase engagement in programs to the same extent possible as their peers without disabilities. And we need to look for activities where AT and systematic instruction can be used to support skill development in the areas of self-management, independence, organization, and time management. So soft skill development, instruction, and self-advocacy can be embedded throughout by providing opportunities for students to develop internal characteristics, such as self-efficacy. And there's a lot of recent studies right now showing that the belief and being able to accomplish a task can help students persevere when they face challenges. And then there's other behavioral characteristics to support during this time as well. And they include other things such as persistence and how to set and execute goals. Those are key pieces for post-secondary success. And there's another resource that's not listed on here, but uh, it's a good one to keep in mind and it's community resource mapping. And what it does is helps provide training on where and when to ask for help. 
And you can implement those activities in high school, and they can be focused on an individualized transition plan, and then they can be implemented independently, or you can frame these as small groups. So if you have a group of students going up to one program, they can work on community resource mapping together. Um, and finally, when providing work-based learning experiences to students with more intensive support needs, additional support and training and workplace skills can transfer those skills necessary in the post-secondary environment. So throughout the progression, there really are items to consider throughout all phases. So we've talked about soft skill instruction, you know, what does the student need to know for each environment he or she is in, how to be prepared, post-secondary setting and their culture, um, what types of assistive technology are needed, how does a student get access, and most importantly, what kind of training will be provided. And then looking at ongoing reflection on learning objectives for each phase and how that information can be used for next steps. Um, these considerations for activities are really create that meaningful, individualized, comprehensive pre-ed plan for students. It aligns with their goals and it should all be captured somewhere. So this may be the transition binder or the information is captured in the summary performance so that students can have ongoing support upon exit from high school. So we are going to take a look at hold on, I need to pull up. I'm going to take a look at a student. Sorry about that. Jenna. So we're going to take a look at an example and just walk through how pre ETS is supported throughout Jenna's experience at high school. So Jenna is a senior at a high school in Western Montana. She enjoys spending time in the community, participating in school activities, and really being social. Um, when Jenna had her transition IEP her sophomore year, she mentioned the transition goal of going off to college. Now she had just witnessed her older sister going off to college and at that point she knew it was something that she really wanted to do. So sophomore year, and this is the first time many team members ever heard Jenna speak of this goal, and she was speaking about it really passionately. So her team began to provide opportunities to create awareness of all the different programs available. And after a semester of looking at different career paths, researching financial aid and programs of study, Jenna narrowed down her list to just a few certificate programs. And then she went to visit Job Corps. And when she was at Job Corps and she learned about the career in health in the health field, she knew she was on the right path. So during her IEP meeting her junior year, the team mapped out steps for the next two years to ensure she would be prepared upon leaving high school. And Je Jenna was eligible to receive VR case management services, so she began working with her case manager to prepare for those goals. So after assessing Jenna's needs for post-school success, VR provided a laptop to help foster good study habits and to provide Jenna with the access to assistive technology. So it was understood that Jenna had difficulty taking notes and she was providing training with using a smart pen, which are pretty spectacular devices to check out, um, screen readers, and learning how to access Google Docs. And Google's, Google Docs is a really big piece that a lot of post-secondary education programs use. Um, so her IEP team and school advisor made sure she followed a track for students pursuing a certificate program by looking at that pathway through academic courses. And all these courses were provided in the least restricted environment. And she also aligned other pre ets activities to support all of those long-term goals. She participated in work-based learning experiences, that followed suit with her interest in the, in the health field, and she took financial literacy courses, soft skills curriculum, and opportunities to really learn and practice self-advocating self for herself. So by exiting from high school, Jenna was enrolled in Job Corps, and she started the summer after her senior year. And at that point, the team had intentionally partnered her with two other Job Corps mentors that were going to help support the social engagement opportunities that were so important for Jenna. 
It also provided an opportunity to access tutoring services and then to really just support that integration. So with her mentors, Jenna learned how to be independent, how to navigate her course load, and then most importantly, how to seek assistance when needed. And her assistive technology skills just blossomed. So what started in, as training in high school really moved her to the next level to support self-management, organization, and due dates. And the scribe she used to do note-taking really made all of her coursework more manageable and to help her with her studies. So when asked about meaningful activities and supports Jenna received in high school, she replied that it was encouragement and support from her team. So that helped create the confidence that she needed to help achieve her goals. And Jenna's just one example of students entering these education programs across the nation. There's some really motivational stories that would be beneficial to share with your students. Um, on the resource page, there's a few links. You can see videos. Students can watch videos of other students with similar disabilities or not um, and watch how they access programs and meet transition goals. So here are some of these resources. And at the bottom, the College Bound, a guide for students with visual impairments, um, or actually the one up from that, the career stories from the National Deaf Center. Some of those stories are really motivational for students and just seeing what it takes and the steps it takes. And I think college offers a lot of opportunities for students to read about other peers. Melissa, I'm sorry to break yes. this, but um, I think your slides are still frozen on the items for consideration. So if you could unpause it and take us to the res There you go. Thank you. OK, so you're there now. Sorry about that. So here, um, let me go back to Jenna. I kind of bulleted her pieces as you went through. So that will be available if you want to just see what steps she took um, throughout going through her experience. Um, here are some post-secondary resources that are more applicable to Montana. And so we have Moving on Montana, July 11 through the 14th, um, happening in Missoula. And then on June 20th to the 23rd, it's happening in Billings. And then the other link is to Montana Youth Leadership Forum, which is a great forum for students to participate in. We've already made it to our question. All right. Slide. Great. And so while um, while we're gearing up for Teresa and Isaac to begin their presentation, we do have time for a couple of questions. And we have a couple here for you, Melissa. Um, one is that in the earlier parts of your presentation, you said ID frequently. And so the question was, is the information that you've presented only for students with intellectual disabilities or does it also include students with disabilities in general? I think so all the information is provided for students with all disabilities. And so those special slides that that or those slides that offer special considerations, those again are not just for students with intellectual disabilities, those are looking at students with overall more intensive support needs or significant impact on their disability. So some of the, the comprehensive transition programs um, there are specific programs that only pertain to students with intellectual disabilities that students can participate in, but you know it's it's looking at all the different programs and seeing the eligibility requirements. But overall, that progression serves all students with disabilities. Great, thank you. And then mm -hmm. a, a comment from Pam at MCIS. Um, inviting audience members who are interested in learning more about the Montana Career Information System, or MCIS, to email um, mcrn at mt.gov. Again, that's mcrn at mt.gov. If you have any questions or would like training about MCIS, um, and she just concurs that MCIS makes college planning way easy, particularly the application tracker. Um, it can help track all of the details that you refer to, including scholarships and college deadlines and requirements. So another plug for um, MCIS. And with that, um, we have a few questions that we'll see if we have time for at the end of Teresa and Isaac's presentation. 
did you have any final comments before we turn it over? No, I'm, um, you can any, feel free to reach out to me with any other additional questions or you know, things that are thought about after the webinar. Excellent. Thanks so much for the great information, Melissa. And next up, we have Teresa and Isaac Baldry to tell us about instruction in self-advocacy as it relates to Priet. Hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you can hear us OK and you're seeing our screen that we've transferred everything over and things look good. I wanted to start with this particular slide because I think the piece that we need to, to hear first is that the, the category, number five, the last one we're going to get to, is instruction in self-advocacy. The instruction being intentional language and really being an important component in what we want to do within self-advocacy. Self-advocacy skills need to be demonstrated, and by that I mean teaching and modeling, role-played, practiced, and evaluated. When we're evaluating them, we want to be looking at if they are effective. Sometimes we talk about things being appropriate, and appropriate can be so um, guided by the opinion or the setting, where really we're looking at, is it effective for the individual? Was the strategy, was the skill, effective for the student? Was it useful? Was there a piece that was missing? So that evaluation tends to lead into the next step and what would I do different or what is needed. So I really wanted to just think about this as being a circular piece within developing these skills. Um, when Kim and I were working on these slides, she kept laughing because I seemed to have a mantra that we needed to, to model and role play and demonstrate and practice and and continue to go around in this circle in acquiring these skills. When we're looking at teaching the skills, such as for a student who may have a learning disability, we might explore what their specific disability is. And it might be that for them, in teaching that skill, we're modeling out loud that you seem to remember information better when you have that opportunity to see the information. We're helping the student with what the language is that would be around being able to state what the challenge is and state how they're best supported in using information. We're going to need to role play it, so have an opportunity to say it to other people. And maybe it just starts in a small group. But then when we're starting to that practice piece, we're looking at some real life situations where they were able to share that little bit of information. And then coming back to evaluating, where did that work for them? What did they need to do? Was that effective for them? Did it make a difference? Did they get the outcome they wanted? What worked really well for you? And what didn't really work for you? And when we're finding what works really well, are we taking the time to capture that for the student? And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Isaac Baldry. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. As a young person and part of the technical assistance team, self-advocacy is an area I like to work in. Think of self-advocacy as a skill, something you need to build. To me, it is filling your bucket one drop at a time. Slowly over time, students increase their skills to help them reach their full potential. Often, we tell youth, you're going to self-advocate. It's time. We, adults, think students need to start advocating for themselves. Just because you need something doesn't mean you have the skills or that you're ready for that step in your life. And just because you don't have a skill doesn't mean you can't gain the skill. Just don't think it's going to happen overnight or all at once. I didn't always think of myself as a self-advocate. It's something I grew into. The first time I was handed a name tag with a label self-advocate, I wasn't even sure that was who I was. I had to think about it and decide if that was who I wanted to be at that time and in that setting. 
Why is it so hard to be a self-advocate? People, especially youth, can be uncomfortable with being called an advocate. I think a lot of it goes back to people feeling uncomfortable because they believe an advocate is someone who confronts, someone who argues. Even one definition I found of advocate as a verb means to speak, urge, by argument. Sometimes as an advocate, you do have to confront someone else. But that doesn't mean that is where you start. We are really talking about making your wants, needs, and choices known. Do you have the opportunity in day-to-day -day life to make choices? Making choices doesn't mean you always have to make the right choice. You can learn more from a wrong choice sometimes. We need to help students learn, as an individual, where are they at, with communicating, their likes, their dislikes, and what their choices are. Is the student willing to share that information with anyone? What do they need, to make them feel safe, in sharing personal information? Maybe, they need to start, by learning more about themselves, and their disability. I think we need to break this into a couple areas. People might think self-advocacy and self-determination are the same thing. They're really two separate skills and students need to have both of them. I don't usually read from a slide, but I was particular about which definitions I wanted to share with you, so I am going to read them both. I put the web location under each. Self-advocacy is learning how to speak up for yourself, making your own decisions about your own life, learning how to get information so that you can understand things that are of interest to you, finding out who will support you in your journey, knowing your rights and responsibilities, problem solving, listening and learning, reaching out to others when you need help and friendship, and learning about self-determination. Self-determination is believing you can control your own destiny. Self-determination is a combination of attitudes and abilities that lead people to set goals for themselves and to take the initiative to reach these goals. It means making your own choices, learning to effectively solve problems, and taking control and responsibility for one's life. Thanks, Isaac. Oops, went one too far. So in case you didn't have a chance to be pulling skills from Isaac's definitions, the WinTAC has a great list of skills when we're trying to break self-advocacy down. And I think it's helpful to, to realize that all of these are components of self-advocacy. It's not just that you now speak for yourself or you now can speak up for yourself. All of these pieces. So Understanding your disability, understanding how to disclose about your disability, the ability to set goals and make decisions, to know yourself, uh, to request and utilize accommodations, understanding rights and responsibilities, understanding disability history and dis disability culture, taking a leadership role in your support planning, listening to others' opinions, and also understanding what level of assertive, assertiveness do you have or do you need. And one that Isaac will talk about, um, that positive self-talk, to be able to support yourself and believe in yourself in moving forward for setting your own goals. So this, I wanted you to have this slide so that as we're talking about things, you could, if, for those of you who kind of want a checklist or a, a list of what some of those skills are, if youth had all of these pieces, how much better would they be prepared for life after high school? Isaac, I'm going to let you go first, and then I'll take over on this one as well. I wanted to talk a bit about self-awareness. I think when we start with learning about being a self-advocate, we have to start with a clear understanding of who we each are, as a person. People trying to instruct in self-advocacy need an understanding that may only come from being a person with a disability. 
Children with disabilities have spent years trying to establish that they are just like everyone else. Trying to fit in and be a part of the group is something you are always aware of. To do that, they are often trying to ignore their disability. After all, that is what makes them different, and being different can't put you on the outside. Now that I have started to work with young people, I often meet youth who do not know they have a disability. They may know they go to a special education room, but they don't know why. They may know they have accommodations that teachers are supposed to give them, but they don't know what they are or why they need them. Sometimes, students don't know about their disability because teachers were protecting them from being labeled. Sometimes families can't face the disability and it is not talked about. When we prevent people from really knowing who they are, they cannot develop an understanding of what they need to be successful. Sometimes learning they have a disability helps them understand pieces about themselves. It can help them not feel there is something wrong with them. They noticed the differences, but they didn't know what it was. For other youth, they may know they have a disability, but how the disability impacts expectations can be a barrier. The disability was the excuse for why they couldn't. Sometimes it was easier than accommodating the disability. Sometimes it was easier than the person with a disability learning something new themselves. Whatever the reason, we have to assist youth in developing the understanding of their disability to explain what they need and why, and then eliminate the disability being an excuse. As a young person with a disability, they should be given opportunities to learn about their rights and responsibilities. How to request accommodations or services and supports they may need as they transition from high school into college or employment. They will need to practice sharing their thoughts. What are their dreams? Do they have concerns about their future? How could someone who also has a disability help them understand their own disability? Do they have a peer mentor? Young people benefit from the opportunity to participate in youth leadership activities. Remember the beginning of my talk, these are skills to build. Students will need to grow in their skills and it will be an ongoing process as they become adults. Not only do youth need to learn to speak up for themselves, they also will need to learn that they don't have to do this alone. Who is part of their team? Who are the people around them who support them? Who are their go-to people? Who are the people both in school or at work or in college who will help them succeed? Young people will also have to be persistent. Things will get easier as they practice. If they don't succeed, they need to learn to try and try again. The independent living centers can be a resource and a part of the team. Independent living centers provide courses in leadership and disability history. Sometimes understanding the struggles and what has been achieved by people with disabilities can help youth develop their own goals. As students are learning information about themselves, what they are good at, what they are interested in, what they need for success, I would like support people to consider how we are capturing this information for their use. I would like you to consider a tool for their personal journey. I think it is important for youth to be able to look back on what they have learned and how they have grown. At times when they are struggling, they can use this information to help develop positive self-talk. Assist them to move from why they can't to how they can. Once youth become comfortable speaking up for themselves within their team, they may want to make changes in their community, their world. They may be given opportunities or seek out opportunities to participate in councils and boards. I think it is important to be an active participant 
where youth can bring their voices as persons with a disability. If we, as young people, want our perspective or our ideas to be part of the conversation, we have to be willing to engage in the conversation. If they plan to participate, they will need to learn how to prepare themselves for meetings. They have to be aware of the items to be discussed and have prepared, maybe even practiced, what they want to share. They may have to advocate for how they will be a part of the meeting. They may have to ask that people take turns in sharing information or that they have a designated opportunity to speak. Sometimes meetings can be a bit chaotic. Occasionally, the voices that really need to be heard aren't given the opportunity. For example, I will ask that information be sent to me digitally in advance of a meeting. I want time to read through what will be discussed and to have time to develop what I feel I can contribute to the discussion. If I am having trouble participating in conversation, I may let the meeting facilitator or chair know I have comments to share and would like an opportunity to speak. Then I don't have to guess when I can jump in with my comments. I had to learn what I needed, practice, and adjust for my success. If I am directing a session for young people, I will often politely ask that adults present in the room, for whatever reason, not be a part of the conversation. I don't do it to be disrespectful. I do it to change the focus and the environment to create an opportunity for the voices that need to be heard. To me, how you engage and participate as a person with a disability can all be summed up in one word, respect. You should be shown respect and valued as a participant. When you are participating with other people, you need to be prepared to help them understand the value you bring. Show respect and expect respect. Unfortunately, there will be times when being a self-advocate feels like a battle. We need to prepare and support students for when advocacy is difficult. It may be because something happens that they feel is discriminatory or unjust because of their disability. I have had this happen time and time again in my life. At first, when it happens, it is very emotional. Students need to know that this can happen to them, and it is alright to feel all those emotions. I tend to look at it as I have two choices, and I will choose which path I take. After the emotions, I have to step back and decide, is this something I choose to address? Sometimes, I decide, my addressing the issue, or asking for change, won't make a difference. Sadly, most of the time for me, I feel, if I won't change it, then who will? Whatever happened, impacted me, and I don't want it, to happen again, to me or someone else. It doesn't mean, that youth have to engage, in every battle. But do they have a way to evaluate, beyond emotions, what matters to them? For me, some of them, are big enough, that I have to choose, to work toward change. The last piece I want to share with you is a bit of my own journey as a self-advocate and being a part of my IEP. In case you haven't noticed by now, my disability limits my ability to communicate. When I was little, because of my desire to share my thoughts, I was introduced to assistive technology. From the very beginning, I was part of the discussion as to if the tool worked for me. What did I like? What did I not like? Being included in the conversation, let me know, my opinion mattered. Once I had the opportunity, to use tools to assist me, I was always challenging the tools, to do more for me. I needed to be part of the conversation, to make sure the tool was meeting my needs. Assistive technology is always changing. I like to be aware, of what may benefit me. I need the opportunity to try out tools, and make my own decision, as to what works best for me. As I move through grade school, 
I needed to share with people my desire to participate with my peers. I needed to help them understand that I wanted to be a part of the class, not just present. By the time I was in high school, I was a regular part of my IEP. In the beginning, I could share what I felt I would need in environments for success, especially my technology. I could share what I thought I was good at, or was interested in, that might lead to employment. We knew I was good with computers, and were able to use that information, to advocate for me to have access, to the strand of computer classes. We didn't talk about them individually, just that this would be my focus of electives. When keyboarding showed up on my schedule, we had to take a step back. I didn't type like anyone else. I wrote with my communication device. Fortunately, the teacher also was willing to look at how and if the class could have value to me. His only goal would be for me to increase my skills. We integrated my technology and skipped the typing curriculum, setting individual goals. When the section on 10 keys came up, we added one to fit my hand and gave it a try. Turns out, I am really good with a 10 key. Who knew? And more importantly, how would we have known if I were not given the opportunity to be a part of what everyone else was learning? I was able to develop my skills to the level job service expected for employment. Pretty cool. Unfortunately, due to multiple conflicts that happened my sophomore year, I decided to drop out of school. I could not handle the stress in some environments, and it was affecting my whole day. After a breather, and with the encouragement of my principal, I was able to come to IEP meetings to talk about what had to change. Because of the stress, I did not have to stay for the whole meeting, I just had to come and share what areas were struggles and what I needed to get back to being successful. My team listened to what I said. We made changes in the IEP, and I could see those changes in my days at school. My principal was a primary advocate to making sure I was heard and saw the changes. His behavior allowed me to gain trust. As things came up, I knew I could speak with him, and if needed, my IEP team. My speaking first at the meetings shifted the focus of the conversation to what mattered to me. By the time I was a senior, I was an 18-year-old adult. If I had a concern about access to the elevator or a ramp in the building, I needed to be able to discuss it as my own advocate with whomever could assist making the changes. Access for graduation needed to be different. It was my job to work it out with my principal as to what mattered to me for my graduation. It wasn't that I couldn't have help. I had brought an advocacy form to my IEP right after I turned 18. I could have support and assistance, but I decided who that would be and how they would help me. An important piece was that I understood these were my decisions. I had the responsibility to determine what was best for me and to communicate my choices. I was given the opportunity to increase my being a self-advocate as I gained confidence in my own abilities. And I was a respected part of the conversation. My team helped to empower me for life beyond high school to have practice and prepare to be the leader in my own life. Thanks, Isaac. Hopefully you can see through what Isaac shared all of the different columns represented, all of the different phases, and some progression through those phases. The other piece I wanted to touch on with this particular slide was that self-advocacy flows through all of the other areas. When we're taking a look at job exploration, we're learning about skills and interests. That ties to that awareness. Um, we could Tie it into preparation by working on goal setting based on a couple interests. What's our goal and building those skills within there? Under work-based learning, we're capturing information on job shadows. So taking that information, 
Are we capturing what an individual likes, what an individual might need in that environment? What, as just as importantly, what do they not like? What do they never want to do again? Um, Isaac really helped me with that when we were exploring shredding paper. Um, he did that as a, a task at home and quickly advocated for himself that that would never be an employment option, even when it was offered to him. Under post-secondary, being able to effectively communicate the accommodations they're going to need at the post-secondary level. And importantly as well, what do they do when an instructor or professor denies them their accommodations? Have we provided that opportunity to practice, develop the language, model through the, the decision making so they can develop an effective strategy for those situations? And then under workplace readiness, um, it ties all into that soft skills, helping them identify what they may need. Communication is tied so into self-advocacy, it, it flows everywhere. And, and what do they need at work so that they can be successful, that they can be their best self? We're going to quickly break these down into the four areas because we're running out of time, so I apologize as I fly through these. So under awareness, we're really looking at, do I know me? Do I have dreams? Do I know what my disability is? Isaac touched on that. Um, do I know what accommodations I have in school and why? Can I talk about my disability? Can I express my needs and wants? Can I make choices for myself about my life? Another important one from that skill set, can I ask for help? Do I see myself as a part of my own plan? We're looking at building an awareness of who I am, what I want to do with my life, and what I want my life to look like after high school. Uh, we want to develop what are the assets that I bring as a person outside of my disability and that who the, what the disability is does not define who the person is. I have some resources here. Sometimes we're looking at you know, some checklists to be able to, to even think about where a student is at. So I try not to refer the, to these as assessments because we're not looking at them for evaluation purposes as far as qualifying for special education, but we're looking at them to get an understanding of where the student is at. And not just where they're at, but do they have an accurate picture of where they're at? We may, in going through checklists, discover things that the youth had never thought of, they hadn't looked at, the family may not have looked at. We're also going to be looking at if they're successful in certain environments, what about that environment makes that workable for them? Why is it successful and how could that be carried over into some other environments? So we're really looking at can they identify what their disability is and what they need to be successful? Do they have a voice in choice making? As basic as that could be, are they given that opportunity? And tying back to that communication. For our significantly impacted students, we may be looking at discovery and just learning more about them in multiple environments and using that process. But we're really looking at understanding some of their preferences. So I've given you a couple of resources there. The next phase or step on that was that exploration piece. So we're, in this section, we're wanting to take a look at what is disability history and culture? Um, take a look at the laws and legislation around disability. Sometimes we uh, don't want to do that component because looking at that disability history can be difficult to hear. But just like any other minority population, they benefit from that opportunity to not only hear about the history, but more importantly, hear how individuals with a disability through self-advocacy, through self-awareness, we're able to implement change. And I think that's an important piece to be bringing into that history and culture piece. Um, looking at some of the resources that are available there, I think that the independent living centers are a fantastic resource when we're looking at that exploration. Um, not too long ago, Isaac and I went through the Ball's curriculum, becoming facilitators, and that's building advocacy 
and learning leadership skills that was developed out of the Summit Independent Living Center. They bring in disability history there. Some of the other independent living centers also have pieces specifically on disability history. That living well or working well with a disability is curriculum that's out of the Rural Institute and can be a beautiful way to really take a look at the impact of the disability. The Job Accommodation Network, if they're aware of what their career interests are, that can help them identifying what some of those accommodations may be. But by this point in exploration, we're really hoping that they can identify what supports, based on what they now know about themselves, they need. What do they need to have their best environment? What works for them? Um, and again, working on that language to be able to communicate, being exploring what language do I need to use that makes sense to me so that I can success successfully communicate. For our significantly impacted students, we really might be looking at some visual resumes, um, looking at how can they begin to start to capture that information about themselves and have a way to use it for positive self-talk and to share with others. Kim brought in a great resource out of Tennessee for folks, even suggesting that opportunity to actually see individuals with a disability impacting their community. They may not be ever given that chance to have that mentoring opportunity, even if it's just to see others with disabilities being successful. And preparation, or to me, preparation is more of that practice piece. So we're looking at giving them that opportunity to, now that we've identified what they, where they're at and what they need, helping them through the, the process of setting those personal goals, teaching them to Think aloud, modeling that how you'll think a lot about a problem. Think about the pros and cons, verbalizing them, and verbalizing for them how you make a decision. How did you reach that decision? Also, it's equally important, they're giving them the opportunity to do that very task and to be able to make a decision and then follow through with the decisions they've made. That can include those mistakes. You know, when we're not talking about it being a health and safety risk, but being given that opportunity to learn from what didn't work. Again, um, got in here for you that the mentoring component, uh, looking at financial literacy, because as we start talking about employment, having an understanding of how to pay bills, um, an understanding of where's your signature and what does your signature mean. And for our significantly impacted students, do you have a signature? So we're really starting to offer opportunities for all students to practice their self-advocacy. Sorry, trying to fly through them again. So the last phase of this being the training in self-advocacy, to me this is where we're really putting practice into intentionally doing. So if we've been working on communicating with a college, can they now demonstrate that skill in speaking with disability support services. Um, I do want to mention the Montana Youth Leadership Forum simply because it was an excellent opportunity for Isaac, but they are right now still taking applications. They're taking applications until March 25th, so getting a hold of them online and, and taking that opportunity to apply to the youth leadership. Even completing that paperwork and understanding what needs to be done there. Um, they have some student-led IEP resources. They've got a pilot project going on for that right now. The ME lessons are a, a beautiful piece on helping with instructional materials for teachers, um, so it's worth taking a look at. So by that training point, they're able to complete this paperwork and attend one of these opportunities. And again, this including our students with the most significant disabilities. So sorry I had to fly through that so fast. There are several checklists listed here that you might want to take a look at on the resource slide, as, as well as um, a really good one that I didn't get to talk about is this error self-determination scale. Uh, that's a good one to take a look at. And then two pieces on the me lessons, once a checklist and then once the instructional material. And with that, I'm going to try and pass this back to you, Kim. I'm not sure I can get there. You can just keep it, Teresa, if you want. I think you have the last two slides as well. So if you just 
want to scroll on. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's okay. Well, we have a couple of minutes for questions, and thank you so much, Teresa and Isaac. I thought it was wonderful to hear how your information dovetailed together. So the things that you shared, Isaac, um, I could hear Teresa how to actually get there through what you shared. So thank you again. Um, we have time for a couple of questions here, and one of the questions actually came in earlier, but I wanted to have all of the presenters live for this one so that any of you who wanted to could answer it. Um, the question is, who at the district, local, or college level provides training to students on what technology is available to them? Um, and this came out of, Melissa, when you were talking about training on assistive technology. Um, for post-secondary, but I think it would apply to training on assistive technology for anybody. So do, does anyone have an answer to that? Who who folks go to for that information? So this is going to be Teresa, and I'm going to just jump in here a little bit since assistive technology is one of my areas. Um, so in the state of Montana, that is going to be district specific as to who you go to within your district to receive that information. Uh, we are definitely a um, individual school climate, so each of the schools has someone, hopefully. If not, they have resources that they can go to. We also, on a state level, have the State Assistive Technology Center, Montec, and they can be pulled in as a resource. So at the colleges, you often have disability support services. They may or may not be familiar with their technology. I, in my experiences with working with them, I've always been extremely pleased in how they do have a strong familiarity with the technology they're providing. But again, what technology is available at each university can vary. They, have, they may have a particular software that they're using. In the state of Montana, uh, I was thrilled that just this last year, all the universities for the first time are on the same literacy software in that they're all accessing Read Write Gold. And even better, it's not something just for students with disabilities. It's something that all students who are accessing college can use. Just like with um, the self-advocacy skills, I think it's something that sometimes we don't think of how it can benefit the whole population. And within that self-advocacy piece, helping students understand that it's something that everybody needs sometimes goes a long way in helping them understand that they really aren't as different as they may have perceived. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, Teresa. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Melissa? Um, maybe just adding that as far as like the team goes through high school and you know looking at all the different settings and environments that the student has um, or could use assistive technology supports. And so you know, making sure that assistive technology team includes teachers, the OT, um, any kind of employment specialist the student might be working with, because you want to make sure that that, you know, that student has access off campus and at the job site. You might be working with the employer to look at those needs, um, speech language pathologists, any educators, family members, your VR counselor. You know, there can be a whole team effort in kind of gathering the information and just making sure that that student is leading the process, and that that student is providing the input and the feedback on the ET devices. You know, so there, there are functional analysis, assessments, you know, things out there that teams use to help guide kind of what are the setting barriers, you know, what, does, what are the student needs, what works well for the students, what's their interest and preference. Um, so there's a lot of supports out there for that. But it is, it's, you know, it takes a whole team at that high school level. Great. Thank you. Um, so we are just about out of time. I have a couple of closing housekeeping things to share with everyone. Just a reminder that the short survey will appear on the screen as the webinar, as the webinar ends. Please do take the time to fill that survey out. Um, I will leave the webinar open for a few minutes after we finish because I've had a couple of people ask about the handouts. And you can download the handouts right from the webinar dashboard. If you look at the upper right-hand area on your computer screen, you ought to see a, um, an orange box with a white arrow in it. If you click on that, it will open up your GoToWebinar dashboard, and you'll see a section called Handouts. 
The handouts that are available include the pie chart that we showed at the beginning of today's presentation, the self-advocacy progression that Melissa talked about, uh, excuse me, that Teresa and Isaac talked about, the post-secondary progression that Melissa talked about, um, a PDF version of today's slides, and then also the Think College resource that Melissa shared with you. So again, as soon as the session ends, I will stop the recording but leave it open and live for a few minutes in case you haven't had a chance to download those handouts yet. Our next pre-employment transition services webinar is scheduled to take place on April 13th. We don't yet have the topic determined for that, so keep your eyes open. Um, an announcement will be sent to the, the listserv members um, letting you know about that webinar, the topic, etc. The recording for today's session will be posted to the Vocational Rehabilitation and Blind Services YouTube channel, and the URL or website address for that YouTube channel is up on your screen right now. Um, it can take two to three weeks for the recording to get posted, but if you go to that website right now, you can see the, the webinars that we've already done related to Prietz, and then check again in a couple of weeks, and you should find today's session. Um, and let's see, I think that was all in terms of housekeeping. I wanted to give a giant thank you to our three presenters today, Melissa, Teresa, and Isaac. Um, you shared outstanding information that I hope people will find helpful. Um, and I wanted to thank all of our audience members for taking the time out of your mornings and afternoons to join us and learn more about pre-employment transition services. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.